Hi guys, it's Kathy. So I didn't realize that they had um, day one reversed in their playlist. Um, so we missed the prosecutor's opening statement. We saw a little bit um, and then we saw the defense attorney. So today we're gonna see the prosecutor's opening statement, which had happened first. Either Ms. Hunley or Mr. Jetty. Thank you, Your Honor. On January 30th, 47, semi automatic assault rifle, and a 40 caliber handgun, and he opened fire. Can y'all hear me better now? Yes, thank you. As I was saying, Mr. Kelly, armed with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle and a 40 caliber handgun, walked out of his house and opened fire on two unarmed men who were unsuspecting. Those men were 115 yards away from Mr. Kelly and his residence. That's the length of a football field. Those men, Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Quinn Butimea posed no threat to Mr. Kelly and no threat to his wife. They were walking parallel to the Kelly residence headed back to the United States-Mexico border. Before firing on those men, George Allen Kelly gave no verbal warnings of any kind. He had no interaction of any kind with these men. Out of nowhere, without saying a thing, without any legal justification, George Allen Kelly let off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire at these two men. He stood on his back patio and he shot that semi-automatic assault rifle through the patio, across a fence line, through a pasture where he keeps his horse, across another fence line, and across a dirt road, and into the back of Gabriel Quinn Butimea. Now Daniel Ramirez, was just steps away from his companion when he saw Gabriel shot in the back and he saw Gabriel fall to his death. Daniel had to run for his life because the shots were still ringing out all around him. The state anticipates that Daniel will come here to tell you about what happened to him that day. Ladies and gentlemen, that is State versus George Allen Kelly in a nutshell. On the screen you see in front of you, on your right, you see a still photo of the video interview of George Allen Kelly on the day of the murder. On the left is a photograph of the view from George Allen Kelly's back patio as you look out toward the area where Gabriel fell and died. <clears throat> this is a photograph of Gabriel Quinn Butimea. And I'm gonna ask you to do something in this case that George Allen Kelly's own words tell you that he did not do. I'm gonna ask you to consider Gabriel Quinn Butimea as a person, as a human being and not as George Kelly described him, as an animal.
Now, again, this is the view from George Allen Kelly's patio. You'll see you're looking out uh, from his patio, um, across, out past his gazebo and towards that pasture area I described a minute ago. And it past that pasture area, past a dirt road, is where Gabriel fell and died. I want to show you the view from the other direction. This is the view through the pergola or the gazebo. If she moves just a little bit, we can sort of see her views on her laptop right there. Like I just saw his picture, but she's standing right in the way. But you can look and you can look right here and see a little tiny picture of what we're seeing. And back toward the area where George Allen Kelly was standing. And you'll see in that photograph, um, sort of on the right, is you look through the gazebo, a door. That's not the main door into the residence. There are actually two doors on this back patio. There's another door that's directly behind that umbrella. And we'll show you another picture later um, that shows that door, but that's actually the door that George Kelly came out of. To the left of that in the photograph are two <coughs> windows. Those are the windows uh, to the living room area, and behind the living room area is actually the kitchen area. This is a photograph of the semi-automatic assault rifle, AK-47, that George Allen Kelly shot and killed Gabriel Quinn Butimeo with on January 30th. And I want to point out a few features on this weapon. There's a green strap on the weapon. And these um, details become relevant when you hear the, when you hear the uh, officers talk about what they observed uh, George Kelly carrying later on in the day. So there's a green strap on the handgun. <coughs> Pardon me. And you'll see that there are some wood features on the AK-47 also, and that the uh, metal on the weapon is a little bit aged from use. So you can kind of see that, um, I think they call it bluing, a little bluing on the weapon. And if you look on the, on the front end of the weapon, you'll see that taped with black electrical tape is a flashlight with an orange button on it. And just below the AK-47 is what's referred to as the magazine. Sometimes it's called the clip because that's what holds the bullets that clips inside the gun. And that magazine holds 30 rounds. And rounds are what they refer to, how you refer to the bullets that go into an AK-47. They're called rounds. So this AK-47 holds 30 rounds. It also holds one round inside the weapon itself for a total of 31 rounds. And you'll hear from the experts in this case that this entire magazine can be expelled, can be shot within less than six seconds. This is just the other side of the AK-47 for you to see. Um, and a better view of that green strap that we referred to earlier. This is the 40 caliber handgun that George Kelly had on his hip that day when he exited his house. Now I want to go back to this view from George Kelly's patio um, because there may be something that you didn't notice about this photograph. And that is that off in the distance, there is a detective standing in this picture wearing a black polo shirt and a tan pair of pants. He's not a small detective. He's uh, about six feet tall. He's a good sized detective. And that detective is standing in the spot where Gabriel Felon died in this case. And that red circle with the red arrow is pointing you to where the detective is. And if you still can't see it, that yellow arrow is now pointing directly at the detective. That's how far Gabriel and Daniel were 
when the defendant opened fire on them that day. Now I want to turn to the area uh, where Gabriel's body was located. This is a photograph of Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's body in place. And what you see in this photograph, first I want to point to the background of the photograph. You see some lights in the background. That is the Kelly residence. And so you can see them sort of off in the, in the, at the top part of the photograph, off in the distance. Now below the, or in, just in front of that, you see it, a tree. Now keep your eye out for that tree because we're gonna go through some other photographs and some drone footage later. And you'll wanna have that as a marker when you're looking, when you're looking for things. In the foreground of the photograph is Gabriel's body. And you'll see that the grass was very high and um, probably about two feet at the time. And it's that yellow straw grass. And you can see that Gabriel's body was very difficult to see in that terrain. Gabriel um, is wearing some tan boots, some tan pants, an olive colored jacket, and a camouflage backpack. This is a close up, a big uh, closer up picture of Gabriel. Again, you can see the tan boots, the tan jacket, or the tan pants, pardon me, the olive colored jacket, and you can see a camouflage fanny pack um, along his side. And you can see the camouflage backpack, which is kind of up over his head. And you can see from these photographs. I'm glad I can't see the pictures now. That Gabriel is unarmed. There are no weapons in these photographs. There were no weapons located near Gabriel's body. In this photograph, you can see the blood seeping through uh, Gabriel's jacket on his back where he was shot. And Gabriel was shot here on his back. And this is a close up of the gunshot wound. You can see the gunshot. You can see the gunshot entry wound um, on his green jacket. And you can see that the blood has seeped around on the jacket. Also in this photograph, you can see that strap from the fanny pack that's down along the side. In addition to the, um, let me just try to switch. He's really, really into it. Like, like this TV, he just moved it so he could see it better, I think. And he looks away every once in a while, but he's really looking at these pictures closely. It's out here. We'll see if that works any better. Sorry for the interruptions, folks. You can also see in this photograph that um, Gabriel has a radio on his waist. So you can see the, the black um, uh, antenna from the radio sticking up on the side of him. And now I kind of want to give you some perspective on what we're looking at here. We looked at those photographs. We talked about what the terrain looks like. But you'll learn during this trial that we asked from us for some assistance from some other agencies. One of those agencies is the Department of Public Safety. And they have an aerial drone footage. And they came out with their aerial drone and they took some video footage and some photos of the terrain. And you'll see on the left, there's a, and, and what those drone, what that drone footage allows us to do is take really accurate measurements from those photographs. And you'll see they're overlaid on a computer screen. The, the um, officer who operates those aerial drones will be able to give you some real good idea how those, how those work. But essentially what the, uh, what the trooper did is he ran that aerial drone, aerial uh, drone over the area and it gives you sort of like a bird's eye view of what that area looks like. And if you take a look, it's kind of hard to see in the photograph on your left, um, but you'll see that there's an up and down line in blue, and that's the north-south line. And you'll see a, a line that goes left and right. That's your east-west line, that's in red. And the green line is measuring the distance 
from Kelly's back, back patio where he shot to the area where the victim's body was located. And it's kind of difficult to see the end of the green line, but can you see it's on the other side of that dirt road? That's the location where Gabriel's body was found. Now on your right, you'll see um, a, the still shot of the aerial drone footage. I'm gonna play that aerial drone footage for you, but I, it goes kind of quick, so I wanna give you a little bit of a preview of what you're gonna see. What you're looking at right now is like three quarters of the top of the Kelly residence, and you can also see the Kelly back patio there. You'll see there's a fountain. You might wanna keep that in your mind as a reference when you're looking at some of these photographs. And to the right of that, you see some orange cones. It's sort of in that general vicinity um, that George Allen Kelly shot that day. And those are where we took the measurements from on the patio was from that, those orange cones. And you'll learn throughout the trial that to the right of the orange cone is the area where the spent shell casings were located in this case. So just to give you some orientation on what you're looking at and what you're gonna hear um, during the trial. But just past this patio, you'll see the gazebo that we saw in the other photographs. Then you'll see a pile of a metal structure on the right that's some kind of smoking pit. And then you'll see a pile of wood just before a fence line. Then you'll see a pasture where the defendant keeps his horse. You'll see the second fence line. And then you'll see the dirt path, the dirt road, dirt path just past that. And then it's past that that you see the tree we saw in the photographs, and then four orange cones that depict uh, the area where the victim's body was located, where he fell and died. So we're looking at the top of the house. That's the orange cones. We're going through the Pergola, there's the wood pile in the first fence line. And it's kind of difficult to see, but if you keep your eyes um, peeled, you'll start to see now the second fence line and it sort of goes up at an angle to your left. And now you see the dirt road and the tree and the four cones where um, Gabriel fell and died. And don't worry if you missed that second fence line, we're gonna play another video um, that show, that goes a little bit slower and you can, you can have a better look. So on to the next video. Um, again, you see that same diagram on your left and on the right is the second drone video. So we're looking again at the top of the Kelly uh, roof, and then we're gonna see that same thing, that patio, um, the pergola or gazebo, and the smoking pit is that metal thing. Then you'll see the, the pile of wood, the fence line, and then keep your eyes peeled for a little bit for that second fence line and then the dirt road. And there are your orange cones the gazebo, the first fence line, and then now you can see the second fence line. And you can see it sort of goes off um, diagonally toward the, toward the road. Everybody see that? And then you see the dirt road? I don't and the four, corn, four cones where Gabriel's body um, was located. And now just to sort of... We don't get to see, and we tried to pay attention, but because we couldn't see, we lost focus, and we missed part of that, ma'am. Sorry. I'm going to give you some orientation, um, because we looked at those photographs, and we saw that Gabriel was shot here. And you could see that the house was this direction and he, we know he was shot in the back. But to kind of give you perspective, we know that he fell forward onto his face into the dirt. 
And so to give you just, and, and this is not to scale, this is just for demonstrative purposes, so you get an idea of the orientation of the body. You can see that small little person we added there to that screen, that shows you the orientation of the body. So he was face down, head to the south, and feet to the north with the um, bullet entry lined up with the back of the Kelly house where Kelly shot from. Okay, okay. All right, if you look at the crowd over here, I thought, okay, they've been looking, they've been looking this direction the whole time. They've been, hold on, let me move myself. They've been looking in this direction the whole time. This crowd right here has been looking in this direction the whole time. I thought they were all just staring him down this entire time, but no, no, no. They're they're looking right here, <laughs> looking at the TV screen. I mean, some of them might be staring him down, but that's the, that's their that's his family. And then this is all the supporters for Kelly, or these might be people who have other cases. Now, based on all of this information and based on what happened that day, George Kelly was charged with two things. He was charged with second degree murder and he was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The second degree murder um, relates to the death of Gabriel and the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon uh, relates to the shooting at Daniel. So second degree murder is one of the more complicated crimes, um, lucky you all, but it's what's called a unified offense. That means there's three ways that the state can prove second degree murder. You all don't have to agree on which theory of second degree murder um, the defendant committed. You only have to agree that he committed one of these theories of second degree murder. And you all have to, you all have to be unanimous that he committed the murder, you can just decide that it that there are different ways in which he committed it. So I'm going to talk to you about the three ways um, that the state can prove during this trial that the defendant committed the murder. The first way is by proving that the defendant intentionally killed Gabriel Quinn Butimea, that he shot him, that he intentionally shot him, and that he caused his death. The second way is the state can prove that Kelly caused Gabriel's death by conduct that he knew would cause death or serious physical injury. So those are the two simple ways. The third way is the more complicated way, but it's also the easiest way. So you can, we can also prove that the defendant committed second degree murder by under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, he recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused Gabriel's death. So that he behaved recklessly, manifesting an extreme indifference to human life, and that he created a grave risk of death and did cause the death. And the risk has to be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person would do in the circumstances. So that second degree murder, one of those three ways is how the state proves that the defendant committed, um, committed second degree murder in this case. And I'd submit to you that the facts of this case, the defendant is guilty on all three of those theories. The second count is aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And in aggravated assault with the deadly weapon, the state has to prove that Kelly intentionally placed Daniel in reasonable apprehension of eminent physical injury. Do we think this is his wife? I mean, I'm sure his wife is in the courtroom. She is in the front row. Well, wait, well, I don't, I can't see this person really well. I can't see this person really well. Pick. Pick who the wife is. In this case, that's by the conduct of shooting a gun in his direction. 
that would place anyone in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. That means that they think they're about to get injured. That's pretty much what that means. And that he did so using a deadly weapon. We know he used his AK-47. And now I wanna to talk to you a little bit um, about the area where this occurred and sort of orient you on what was happening that day. This is just a map of Santa Cruz County, just to give you an idea of the location where this happened. We're in Nogales. Um, we can see that on the map there. We're in the area that's a little bit white. Um, all the major uh, residential areas in the county are on here, Rio Rico, um, Tubac, Sonoida, Elgin, and you can see those all on the map. You see the area circled in yellow. That is Keno Springs. That is the area where this event took place. And this area, this is a close up of the area of, uh, that's at issue, which is really just south of the Keno Springs residential area. And you'll see um, to the right on this map in white is an area called Pedregoso Tanks. That's an area that's in the National Forest. And as I said, um, Keno Springs is, the residential part of Keno Springs is just to the north of this. And Nogales, where we are today, is just to the west of this area. And to the northeast of this area is Patagonia. And you'll see along the bottom here is the United States-Mexico border. And you'll see this area where the arrow points is right where the border wall ends. You'll see like a dirt road that comes right up from the map where that arrow points um, that the border wall ends. That is right where the border wall ends, right where that road comes directly up from the end of, of the border wall there. Over on the right of this map is the National Forest. And the National Forest right where the border wall ends is where the national forest begins. And on January 30th of 2023, let me go back to that map for a second. Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Quen Butimea were with a, with a group of undocumented migrants, illegal immigrants, who crossed the border illegally at the end of the border wall. And they crossed the border really early that morning and they hiked up into the national forest. And they'd been hiking all day in that area. And you're gonna learn for, you're gonna meet Daniel. Daniel's gonna come here and testify. And you're gonna learn that Daniel is a really humble guy. Daniel comes from Honduras and Daniel um, had spent many years in Mexico. He has a fifth or sixth grade education and he generally works as a farmhand um, on a small, um, in a small village in Mexico. And you'll learn that obviously for someone with his educational background and with his occupation, he struggles um, to get by in the off season. And in sometime before January of 2023, he was working a masonry job during the off season in Nogales, Sonora, and he, he met Gabriel Quen Butimea. And he and Gabriel started talking about getting work in the United States as a roofer. And as they talked, um, Daniel decided that sounded like a good idea. And so he paid illegal um, folks to, tr to um, come across the line illegally. He paid a fee to come across the line. And you'll hear that Daniel was, um, traveling across and up and through the National Forest that day with Gabriel and, and with a group of men, about seven, seven or eight people all together. And they were traveling up through the National Forest. They traveled most of the day. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon and they encountered some border patrol officers. And so they decided to scatter. They took off running all in different directions. Gabriel and Daniel stayed together and they decided they were gonna go back into Mexico and just give this a try another day. And so they were running, fleeing from border patrol, running pretty fast. 
for about a half an hour. And it was at about that time that they decided they were gonna take a little bit of a rest. They were, they were worn out from running, um, they're headed back to Mexico and they're gonna slow down and take a rest. And Daniel didn't even have time to register that there was a residence around. The only thing Daniel saw was a red horse, a skinny red horse. And he saw that horse off to his right. He's walking along a dirt path. Um, dirt path is sort of off to their right. And he sees this skinny red horse off to his right. And they're walking along and they see this skinny red horse and out of nowhere, a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire comes their direction. And they're walking and Daniel sees Gabriel just a few feet ahead of him get hit in the back with an assault rifle fire, with the assault rifle fire. And he sees him grab his chest and say, I'm hit. And he sees him fall in front of him and die. And then Gabriel, because the shots are still ringing out all around him, takes off running and runs for the border, running for his life. Now at around 2.30 that day, George Kelly came to his house to have some lunch. And he was in his kitchen making his lunch at his kitchen island when he sees something outside that catches his attention. And just sort of to give you a little bit of an idea, George Kelly's house is about a, a little less than a mile and a half from the United States-Mexico border. His property is about 170 acres and it's surrounded by a large ranch, the Buena Vista Ranch. The Buena Vista Ranch is on the west side of his property, so the Nogales side, and the south side of his property. On the east side of his property is National Forest, and to the north is that Keno Springs residential area. Excuse me. And George Kelly was in his house that day making his lunch when he saw something outside that caught his attention. Instead of calling 911, he has his 40 caliber handgun on his hip. He goes to his back door, grabs his AK-47, and tells his wife to call the Border Patrol, to call the Border Patrol Ranch Liaison specifically. And his name is Jeremy Morcel. And so Wanda Kelly picks up her phone, calls the Border Patrol, and George Kelly goes outside and lets off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire. These are the two weapons that George Kelly had that day. We've already talked about those. And again, this is the view from George Kelly's back patio where he went out and let off that semi-automatic assault rifle fire. And that's the area where Gabriel and Daniel were that Gabriel fell and died. This is Jeremy Morcel. Jeremy Morcel is that ranch liaison that um, George Allen Kelly's wife called that day. The job of a ranch liaison is kind of just what it sounds like. Border Patrol needs to have access to properties that are close to the border in order to do their work. And so they work hard to have good relationships with people who are near the border. And the ranch liaison's job is to facilitate that access um, to those properties, to work with the residents to have them allow the Border Patrol to have access, and also to facilitate communication with those folks, to make sure those folks know when there's an operation going on so they can stay out of the way, um, so they don't, don't put themselves in the middle of an operation, and so that the homeowners can communicate with the Border Patrol if there's any information that they want to pass on to help Border Patrol with their job. So that's what Jeremy Morcel's job is. 
So this day at 2.30, George Kelly uh, calls Jeremy Morcell. And he says to George, I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back. He says, I can't talk right now. There's five people all running southbound with packs. And Jeremy Morcell will tell you that during that phone conversation, George Kelly was very rushed and very frantic on the phone call. And you're going to wonder, Kim, why are you giving me all these details about these phone calls and these statements? It's because throughout the day, these stories shift from moment to moment with Mr. Kelly. And it'll be important for you to take good notes about what Mr. Kelly says and when he says it and when that story changes because that's a shifting story throughout the day. So that was the first call. While that call is happening, Agent Morcell is um, talking to the appropriate people in his dispatch center, um, making sure that Border Patrol gets dispatched out and also making sure the Sheriff's Department gets dispatched out because Mr. Kelly has said there's a shooting going on. About 2.36, Jeremy Morcell calls Kelly back. At this time, Kelly gives him a slightly different story. He tells him he had an altercation with these people and they're headed toward Keno Springs, which is now the opposite direction that he said during the first phone call. And he says something about maybe they're trying to circle back or something of that nature. He says on this call, not I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back, but I heard a gunshot in my direction and he saw his horse running by. And it's unclear in this phone conversation, is he outside when he hears the gunshot or is he inside when he hears the gunshot? And that changes again later, whether he's inside or he's outside when he hears this alleged gunshot. A gunshot, by the way, that no one else hears other than George Allen Kelly. When he's on this conversation at 236 with Jeremy Morsell, he says that he's inspecting his horse and that it doesn't look like his horse was shot. Now the horse is gonna be important because you're gonna hear from Daniel about the horse and how Daniel believes that the horse got shot. And he believed at the time that the horse got shot and he thought the horse saved his life. From his view of what was happening at that time, that's what he thought happened. And clearly George Allen Kelly also thought something happened to his horse because he's busy inspecting him at this point. George said that, that, and this is the important piece of this phone conversation, the people were too far away to tell if they had any kind of firearms. 115 yards away, they were too far away to tell if they had any firearms. George Allen Kelly could not tell if they had any firearms. And we saw that from the picture we saw a few minutes ago about the location where Gabriel fell and died. During this phone conversation, he was quite a bit calmer than he was during that second phone conversation. So the next thing that happens is officers have been dispatched out and the Border Patrol gets there really quick. They're there within about 10 minutes. Um, this is a pretty remote area. So that quick of a response time is pretty, pretty great. So when the Border Patrol arrives, um, the first Border Patrol agent, there's two Border Patrol agents in total who, who go out to the scene during this first call for service, and five sheriff's deputies respond. When the first deputy arrives, um, or the first Border Patrol agent arrives, he learns that Mr. Kelly is headed south um, in the property, that he's taken off south from his house on the property. And before they go looking for Mr. Kelly, they decide they're going to search the area of the house for any kind of immediate danger. So they kind of split up, um, the, actually six of them, because the fifth deputy doesn't get there until pretty much everything's done. 
Um, so the six of them split up. They search that immediate area, the pasture by the house. They search the area around the house and they tell Mrs. Kelly, stay in the house. We're gonna go, we're gonna go look around. The border patrol agents head off, they just sort of hike straight across the, the property. And you'll see that they locate Mr. Kelly about a quarter mile south of the house. Um, not far from a barn and a, and a mechanical pump house, like it's a pump house where you pump w water from a well in the ground. So it's got a little pump house and it's down in that area that the border patrol find him. And when they do find him, by the way, they see him walking with his dogs. He's carrying an AK-47 and there's, they don't locate anyone else. No, none of the deputies, none of the border patrol locate anyone else uh, while they're there. This is a, a map just to give you an idea of the Kelly property. And you'll see at the top of the map in white is the Kelly residence. You'll see that area in blue is the area of the residence. And around the edge of the blue line is about where Gabriel's body was located. The area in green is the barn. Um, they have a big metal barn. It's that metal barn near that area and this yellow circle is the is the pump house it's in that area where the um, border patrol find mr kelly walking in that location just one other thing for you to note for the property there's also an area here of corrals and some water troughs that may at some point during the trial you you may want to know where those are just to give you an idea and you'll see that there's a dirt road that goes through the property. Um, that's the just the Kelly's uh, sort of driveway through their property. And you'll also see in this map that there's a, a wash that one runs through the Kelly property. You can kind of see that in the drone footage we looked at off in the background. You can see a little piece of the dirt road and you can see the, see the um, wash that's kind of down below. But those are just some items for you to have an idea of so that they may become important during the trial. Ms. Honey, stand by one second. Yes, All right. Um, court reporter's been going for about an hour and a half. And uh, they need a break, as do the interpreters. Keep them going too much farther beyond that. The, all the data we have suggests generally that they could prone to mistakes. So we'll take a 10-minute recess, uh, and um, we'll continue with the opening statement. I'm going to try that with my boss at work when I'm serving. I've been going for an hour and a half. I think I need a break. <laughs> I've been going for six and a half hours. I need to sit down. No. People need ranch. Extra water with lemon. I don't know. His side's gotten more full. I don't think they're there for other cases now that I think about it, because they do this all day. And we can see her a little better. Turn your head, woman. Is that his wife? Could that be his wife? Maybe it's this one right here. Maybe this is his wife. Oh, I'm in your way. I'm thinking it's this one right here. Could be this one. Maybe that's his wife. Thank you, everyone. Please have a seat. All right, the records show the presence of counsel, uh, the defendant, and all of the jurors. Well, all right, so uh, everyone noticed that there's no water pressure in the building. Um, <clears throat> just found that out myself. Apparently, a pipe burst in the city of Nogales down on 
I think first street, which is down farther into the city. There's no water here. There's no water anywhere uh, out of our control. I apologize. So what's happening is, um, well, before I tell you what's happening, I want to make sure I get this in. Um, what I'm told <laughs> just to make things uh, more fun. Uh, what I'm told is that sometimes when the water pressure goes down to a certain level, the fire alarm can go off uh, because there's no water pressure. If that goes off, you won't miss it. Trust me, I've heard it before. Uh, it's pretty startling, but there's no reason to panic because there's no fire. So everyone don't, you know, head for the exits. Just stick your fingers in your ear because you need to preserve your hearing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to continue with the opening statement. I know you've all just had a communal toilet experience. It's very important. It's very important for jurors to bond. <laughs> it's not the kind of way we hope you bond, but uh, you just had your first bonding experience as jurors. I hope it went well. But what, what we'll do then is we'll break for lunch. I'm going to have you come back after lunch. We're going to continue with the opening statement. Um, and uh, we'll break for lunch. I'll have you come back at 1.30. But if they haven't fixed it or telling us that they can fix it, you know, in a very reasonable amount of time, then we're just going to have to recess for the day because I'm not going to make all of you continue with your fun bonding experience. I think once was probably enough. So we'll do that. All right. Um, again, it just happened that we just found out about it. It's nothing to do with our building, the, the whole complex, the jail. Um, everybody's got without water. It'll probably be citywide. All right. Um, any questions about that? So that's the plan. We'll come back after lunch. Hopefully it'll be fixed or soon will be fixed. And we'll be able to continue. If not, then we're just going to have to recess for the day. Any questions? Sound good? All right. You know what I know. You can continue with your opening statement. Thank, Thank you. you. So we were talking about um, about 3 o'clock, 3.15 that afternoon. Uh, the Border Patrol located Mr. Kelly, and they found him walking with his dogs, and he was carrying his AK-47. It was that AK-47 that has the green strap on it with the wood um, pieces to it and the, and the metal. And one of the officers actually noticed that the AK-47 had a flashlight taped to the end of it with black electrical tape. And during this call for service, the officers had all split up into separate teams. So they took three separate statements from Mr. Kelly during this time. And we'll go through those uh, during the trial, uh, but we're not gonna go through all of them here today. This is the first statement that George Kelly gave about three o'clock or 3.15 to Deputy Castaneda. And Deputy Castaneda was the lead, lead officer uh, for the Sheriff's Department that responded to this first call for service that day. And what George Kelly told um, Deputy Castaneda is that he was standing in his kitchen, which is sort of in that red dot area on the house, um, and he looked through his kitchen. Um, there's, a, there's a wall between the kitchen and the living room, and it has like a cutout for a counter. And so he looks through the cutout um, and from the kitchen, through the cutout, through the living room, and out the living room windows, and he sees uh, movement outside. He says that he sees five people running south from that view. Again, that's the living room windows. We looked at those pictures a minute ago. You're looking at the back of the house, and so you'd see the living room windows, the living room, that wall, the cutout for the counter, and then the kitchen island, and he was standing at that kitchen island. This is that other photograph. You see now why I included the photograph that was not a crime scene photograph that has um, other vegetation that showed that other door, um, because this is a dark photograph and it's harder to see. But in this photograph, you can see both doors. You can see the door to the right, which is the door into the master bedroom, and you can see the door on the left, which is the door into the main living areas of the house. That's the door circled in blue that George Kelly came out that day. 
and on the left are those, are those two kitchen windows. And what Kelly said he did was that he went to that east door, he grabbed his AK-47 that he keeps by the door, and he went outside and he saw people were possibly carrying rifles. That's what he tells Castaneda during this, um, this interview. So we know this is different from what he told um, Agent Marcel on the phone. He told Agent Marcel they were too far away to tell. And now this time he says they're possibly carrying rifles. And then he goes on to say that he heard a single gunshot from an AK-47. And he believed that the people had encountered another cartel and they shot at them to scare them off and that's why he saw them running. He said he saw the people approximately 100 to 150 yards away from the residence and that after that, he never saw them again. So all he sees is people 100 to 150 yards away from the residence and he never sees them again. He says he walked back through his property to locate the people, but he didn't find them. And that's when the police arrived. He says, he tells Castaneda, he believes there's way more of them than he saw out there, but he's just speculating. He doesn't really know or have any reason um, to make that speculation. He's just speculating. And Castaneda tells Kelly that if anything like that happens again, Stay inside your house and call 911. And Kelly says something very interesting at that time. Kelly says he understands Castaneda has given him advice, but he's going to do what he had to do to protect his property. He was conscious of the consequences, and he would take responsibility for his actions. The deputy reiterated to him again, stay inside and call 911. Here's the important part about all of these three statements that he gave to law enforcement that day. He never one time admitted that he shot his AK-47. He never told law enforcement that anyone pointed a gun at him. And he never told law enforcement that he was in fear for his life at any point that day. The next um, thing that happens in this case is Deputy Morcel gets another phone call after law enforcement leaves that day. And that phone call comes in about 4.23 that afternoon. And Deputy Morcel, I, I believe, is already off duty at this point, and he takes the call from Kelly. And Mr. Kelly tells him that he's very thankful for the responsiveness and how quickly the agents got there. And he wants to meet up the following day to sort of debrief about what happened. And Agent Marcel will tell you that that's kind of a normal thing if there's some kind of border patrol incident that the, that the ranch liaison will go meet up with the homeowner. So that wasn't an odd request by Mr. Kelly that day. He said that during this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly just started rambling on um, during the phone conversation. And he was getting super excited about what had happened earlier that day. And then he started telling the story again about what happened. And he started sort of, uh, embellishing on what he'd told him earlier that day. He said he and Wanda were in the house and they heard a gunshot. And now you'll hear this is different. Instead of hearing the gunshot when he's outside, he's hearing the gunshot from the inside. And we went out onto the porch. He went out to, onto the porch and he saw his horse running by. And Wanda saw it too. There were 10 people all loaded down with AR style rifles 10 to 15 of them had rifles. So this is the fun, this is the story at 4:23. And again, um, the agent will tell you that he was super amped up during this phone during this phone conversation, um, differently than his conversation earlier in the day. An hour goes by, and Jeremy Marcel misses the phone call from. George Allen Kelly. And this is the phone call that he missed. Voicemail. Jeremy, this is Alan Kelly. You need to call me immediately. This is serious. Call me immediately. I can't 
can't say more over the phone. Bye. Then after that voicemail message, which Jeremy Marcel will tell you that was an unusual tone of voice for Mr. Kelly, he got this text message at 526, also saying, call me immediately. Agent Morcell, about 535, at this point, he's off duty. He's actually at the gym working out, and he just didn't hear his phone ring um, when, it called the first time, when he called the first time. He didn't catch the text message. And he happens to walk over and notice <coughs> that he's missed a text and missed a call. And so he tries returning Mr. Kelly's call. They kind of play some phone tag back and forth. They're both trying to call one another. Eventually, they connect um, on the phone. and. There's another phone conversation at 535. During this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly's demeanor is completely changed. He's evasive, he's nervous, he's scared, and his demeanor is totally different. He's a totally different person. During that fourth phone conversation, Kelly says, this is worse than you can imagine. This is bad. And he just kept repeating that. Morcell then offers to him to send out um, the sheriff's department and uh, the border patrol. And he tells him, just tell me what's happening so that I can tell folks what you need. And Jeremy and Mr. Kelly tells him, um, is continuing to be evasive. And Morcell then suggests that Kelly call 911. If he needs help, if something's happening, that he should call 911. And Kelly says to him, you need to get border patrol. This is a border related issue. And then he tells them, you know how shots were fired earlier? Something was possibly struck. And as Morcell continues to push for additional details, Kelly tells him, I can't tell you more over the phone. And then he asks Morcell, is this being reported? He somehow thought that a conversation with a law enforcement officer wasn't going to be reported if it was the Border Patrol. So Mr. Kelly did not take Agent Morcell's advice. He did not call 911. But Agent Morcell called his dispatch, and his dispatch called 911. And then 911 called Mr. Kelly. And when 911 called Mr. Kelly, the, night, the dispatcher had a very interesting conversation with Mr. Kelly. When she first speaks to Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly says, It's very serious, ma'am, and I can't, I'm not going to talk over the telephone. Yeah, I know I can talk to you, but you're responsible for what I say, and I'm responsible for what I say. Uh, I didn't shoot at any. I haven't said I shot at any. And then his voice quivers and he says anything. I don't want to get you in trouble. And I, I don't want to get me in trouble. Okay, he sighs. You know, you know the thing. You have the right to remain silent. And anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done. But all those things tend to add up. And I don't know what happened. I just know, I just know what I saw about 15 minutes ago. And then when, the, when he eventually gets to the point that he's marked a body with a flashlight, he tells her, I have it marked. I've got a flashlight on over it. And the dispatcher says to him, do you know who it is that you saw? And he says, no, I didn't say I saw any body. I just saw a body. And then he goes on to say, and from, from what in that, in that I only approached the body to make sure that the, that the animal, uh, it's not a vegetable or a mineral, the animal wasn't alive, and it was not alive. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a, a, an animal laying face down, an animal. And you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral. It's a body. And you know what I'm talking about. 
But I think more than the words of what he said to dispatch, when you hear the tone of what he says during this call, you'll see the impact of what it is that he's saying. You're going to have to send um, an officer out here. Okay, what's going on? I can't. I'm sorry? It's very serious, ma'am, and I can't. I'm not going to talk over the telephone. Okay, I understand it's serious, but I need more context in order to send a deputy. <laughs> okay, fine. It's going to be... Uh, Go ahead, well, you can talk to me. What's going on? Yeah, I know I can talk to you, but you're responsible for what I say, and I'm responsible for what I say. Uh, can you give me a little context of what, what happened, what's going on? Uh, you told them that I'm you not shot sure. at I, I'm, I, What did you shoot at? I didn't shoot at any. I haven't said I shot at anything. Okay, uh, well, what, that's what Border Patrol told us, so that's why I'm just asking you. Yeah, yeah. Y'all guys, you... The Nogales Sheriff's Department had four or five guys out here this afternoon investigating a Border Patrol drug running incident. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, and I don't know if you, I can't remember the, the officer's name. There was two gentlemen and two young ladies, mm -hmm. uh, maybe third. You know who I'm talking about? They came out to 100 Willow Cross Circle. You, you mean for my deputies, correct? Yeah, they were they were Nogales. Yeah, I'm aware of what happened earlier. Uh -huh. You're aware? Okay, then they're aware of what happened, and uh, I don't want to get you in trouble, and I, I don't want to get me in trouble, or I, but I don't want to break the law or anything like that. So what I'm telling you is that uh, we need a sheriff deputy out here, 100 Willow Cross Circle, Immediately, and that's all I can say, ma'am. Okay, is uh, anyone hurt? I need to know because if someone's hurt, I need to send an ambulance too. There's, there's no, there's no. Okay, do you feel more comfortable talking to a deputy over the phone? Uh, well, in other words, okay. You know, you know the thing. You have the right to remain silent, and anything you can, I understand. Uh, anything you say can and will be held against you uh, in a court of law. I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but you know, all those things tend to add up, and I don't know what happened. I just know what I, I just saw about 15 minutes ago, and it's something that an ambulance cannot help. EMTs cannot help. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing out here that that can be aided by EMT uh, or emergency services. There's, uh... Okay, I understand you don't want to give me a lot of details, but um, what you are requesting an officer from me, so I just needed to know for their own safety and your safety a little bit of what's happening, what's going on. Okay, uh, I'll put it like this. Last spring out here uh, there was a, a pickup found on East Sagebrush uh, with a dead lady in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you knew of that or not. Um, uh, yes, sir. I'm aware of what happened. Okay. It's a, it's a situation similar to that. How's that? Okay. You, you, you follow it? You understand what I'm saying? I it's a situation exactly like that. Okay. And, and so that's going to require the sheriff to come out here. Okay. Can you tell me a description of is the no, vehicle? I, I don't. I don't have a description. There's not a vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, the only thing that I was referring to in conjunction with that accident? accident was was the body. Okay. You got it? Okay. All right. What is, okay. Can I have your name? Yes. George Kelly. George Kelly. Okay, George, would you, if my deputy goes over there, would you take him to whatever it yes, is that you yes, found? Yes, I have it marked. I have a flashlight on over it because uh, it's going to be dark when he gets here probably, but I'll take it to him. Uh, just. Um, and you are sure an EMT cannot help? I am positive. I have a medical background. An EMT cannot help. Do you know whoever it is that you saw? No, I do not know. I didn't say it was anybody. I just said it was a body. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'm not Jay. I'm not trying to be smart, ma'am. I'm no, just trying I understand. to. I'm, you're trying to be careful, and I get that. However, um, I hope you understand that on my end, I have to take care of my deputies, too. So I really yes, needed I understand. a little bit more context as to why you needed a deputy to head out there. Now you know that, that okay. there is a body here. Okay. All right. Does it look um, somewhere? It's, it's not alive. So you asked if you need EMT. I said no. Okay. I'm sure a coroner, a coroner will be involved sooner or later. I understand. Uh, George, can you tell me something? Um, is it discolored from somewhere? Is it discolored? Yes. What does that mean? Um, has it been there for a while? Can you tell? Mm, uh, from from what? In that in that I only approach the body to make sure that the animal uh, is not a vegetable or a mineral. The okay. animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. Okay. Well, uh, there were no signs. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a. Uh, uh, an animal laying face down. An animal? An animal, and you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral. Okay. It's a body, and you know what I'm talking about. I understand what you're talking about, George. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to send the deputy then over to your house so you can lead them over to wherever you found what it is okay. you found, okay? But now, uh, maybe one of the deputies were out here. They know how to get here because it's 100 wheel across circle and it's kind of hard to find it's a ranch right on the border so i have one of my deputies that responded earlier going over your way there, that's good you do that they know how to get here and i'll have the gate open okay sounds good george thank you thank you for I, I appreciate your help and your patience and i'm sorry if no i I'm sorry. okay okay bye. thank you all right bye-bye it was just a few minutes after that um, that the first deputy arrived for this second call for service. And that was Deputy Rafael Lopez. And Deputy Lopez had responded to the scene earlier in the day, but he was one of the later deputies. He was that later deputy who got there after really everything had finished up earlier in the day. And what Deputy Lopez did when he got there was he turned on his recorded recorder and he recorded um, as soon as he arrived at the scene for a few minutes of what George Kelly was reporting to him. And this is that recording. I was afraid somebody had shot him because, it, you know, some of those, there, there was a shot fired and I didn't know what it was about. Okay, so I went out to get the horse. I always bring him in and feed him, put him in another pasture. I went out there to get him. And y'all guys, did you, you weren't over here? Yeah, I was here. here. Y'all walked all over that. And the Border Patrol worked all over it. And I, maybe this happened after you left. Was I don't know. Body right now? There's a body right now. Is and it I don't, a fresh body? Yes. Not fresh. I didn't, I didn't, as soon as I saw it, I backed away from it. It's lying place face down. Okay, let's yeah. go. It's, it's dead, though. The body, it's, it's, it's a person in there. So when, when, when do you think this, this happened? Or what I, happened? Do you know who it is? Is it a, is it a civil death? I, I have no, I have no way of, of, of being a judge. That he was a mule. You know what a mule is? It's a drug runner. So he has a pack, a hall pack. Now, if you remember, I, we saw five to ten drug runners coming through with large backpacks. Yes. He did not have a large backpack on, but he had a small ammunition 
band here and camo and so and we just talked to I just as soon as I found him came straight back to the call. I called Border Patrol because they were the first ones I called. Because I didn't really know how to call you guys. So I called Border Patrol, Jerry Morissette. He called the Border Patrol agent uh, and, and they said and he said they're gonna call the sheriff and they'll send someone out there. Then your your secretary or, or dispatcher I should say called me. I was on the phone with her when you drove up. Okay, okay. And she said he's coming out right now. Okay. Uh, and, and, and and I mean you know what happened to him? I mean you I have no idea. You shot him or I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. And you know, if you were me, you got no idea. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so check it out. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. You just go I'll ahead and drive my car. Okay. You go ahead. I'll, I'll walk. I'm going to leave the gate open. Yeah. My dogs won't bother you. There's two black ones? Huh? There's two black ones? Yeah, they're good dogs. Yeah. They're okay. Not, they won't bother you. I'm sorry to, to, to drag you out, but this is something that it ain't. Serious. Yeah, no. I mean, it ain't like somebody stole my property. Yeah, they're still on their own stuff. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, I got a question for you. You know, since you're in this thing called uh, Red Army, what do you think about this? Uh, I guess it's not Red Army. It's uh, the Army of Red Army. Is here, you know, she saw y'all walking all out there. Mm-hmm. She said, They walk, and I, my wife knows where it is. She said, They walk all over here. Yeah, she so it could be a body that it could be the body could have expired after y'all were here. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. We don't know yet. Stuff running around all over this place all the time. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. How far is it from here? Hey, I'm up in Texas. Okay, I'll, I'll he- start heading over there. You can, you can, you can park right there and see that, that work trailer. Yeah, we'll see the, see the work trailer? Yeah. The tractor? Uh-huh. Park there, right there, there, and we'll there, go there, through there, the gate, and I'll take you straight to it. Okay. I'll be, I'll be there about 10 minutes. Okay. What is the reason you want to interview us over there? Shortly after this, um, Sergeant Omar Rodriguez arrives at the scene. And Sergeant Rodriguez meets up with Deputy Lopez and George Kelly by a horse trailer that's down by a gate um, into the into the pasture area of where the um, where the horse was kept in the, by the house. And what's when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived about six fifteen, he saw that Kelly was wearing that Glock handgun um, still on his hip, and he asked Mr. Kelly if he would be willing to take that handgun off for officer safety reasons and leave it behind in the trailer. And Mr. Kelly agreed to do that. He took the weapon off and left it um, in his horse trailer that's right next to the gate in that pasture area. From there, Kelly took Rodriguez out to the body and they walked around on that dirt path that goes around from the, from the, driveway that you saw, that dirt road that's the driveway, they took the dirt path around the outside of the pasture back to where the body was located. And they found the body near that tree that we saw, and the defendant had tape, had hung up a flashlight in the tree so that they could locate it, because it was starting to get dark at this point. And as I mentioned before, the sergeant found the uh, Gabriel's body laying face down with his head toward the south with his face implanted in the dirt and his um, legs were towards the north so and we, we showed a little picture of that earlier on how the body was positioned and when when um, Sergeant Rodriguez got a good look at the body he could see the gunshot entry wound in Gabriel's back. And he could see that that was on the right side of his body, which then lined up with the Kelly's residence. 
Later, they were able to look and discover that the gunshot exited from the chest. He made another, a number of other observations about the body. He saw that there was no pulse. Um, the extremities were, were cool, but the torso was still a little warm to the touch. He looked around the area because of the story that Mr. Kelly had about these other people and, and things of that nature. He looked around and he saw there weren't any drag marks. There wasn't a blood trail. There was nothing to indicate. There were groups of people nearby. He saw nothing like that in the area. And nothing at all to indicate that a body had somehow been dumped there or anything of that nature. It appeared to, the, to Sergeant Rodriguez as if Gabriel had fallen there and died. And he noted, as I said before, that that gunshot wound generally lined up with the trajectory to where George Kelly was shooting from on his back patio. And again, just a reminder of the photograph of how he found the body. And I think we've already gone through all this, but it, it kind of shows you where that gunshot wound was lining up with the residence. And again, just the body positioning with that tiny little stick figure to just show you how the body was laying with the gunshot entry on the house side. Now, a short while, a little while later, after they do their investigation there at the scene and they gather the information uh, about what had happened earlier in the day from all their sources, George Kelly's transported um, to the sheriff's department for an interview. He's read his Miranda rights and a video interview is conducted of him. And this is the still shot from that video interview that happened about 8.29 p.m. that night. So we're talking maybe six hours after the homicide. And you'll learn that during that interview, George Kelly tells Detective Ainsa that he was eating lunch in the kitchen and when he looked out through the living room window and he heard a shot. Now he's in the house when he hears the, hears the shot before he's outside when he hears the shot. He hears a shot, it's, it's close, and he saw, sees this horse running by. He says about 100 to 150 yards out, he sees men running with tan shirts and pants with a full brown big solid backpack on. He then clarifies that he saw them and then he heard the shot after he came outside. And he says that he saw them run into the arroyo. He told this whole story without admitting that he shot his AK-47. Never admitted he shot his AK-47. It was about 30 minutes into the interview and after Detective Ainsa pressed him about conversations that Kelly had earlier with um, Agent Morcell, when George Kelly finally admitted he shot his AK-47 that day. He says to Agent, or to, uh, pardon me, Detective Ainsa, that they were running and he moves his hand from left to right, parallel with me. They were parallel to the house. I'm telling you the truth, I made, did not make the statement that I shot somebody or shot at or shot somebody or shot, period. So then he's denying that he even told Agent Morcell that he had shot his AK-47. And when Detective Ainsa presses him and says, did you shoot? George Kelly admits, yes, he shot. And then he claims that he shot over their heads. And when Detective Ainsa asks him, how far were they when you shot him? George Kelly says 150 yards. Well, we know where Gabriel's body was discovered, 115 yards from the back of the Kelly residence. 
And why did you shoot at them when they were running away from you? Detective Ainsa asks. And Kelly says, because when you're out there in that situation and, and you have people that, that they weren't running away from me, they were just running. And you said earlier that they were running away. They were running across, hand moves from, again, his hands moving from left to right, across the wash. And then he clarifies that they were running 100 to 150 yards away again. And then he says, now he says they're armed. And the detective then asks him, when they were running with the rifle, did they ever point their rifle at you? Up until this point, George Allen Kelly has never said a peep about these individuals pointing a gun at him. And we know based on what he told Agent Morcell earlier that they were way too far away for him to see if they had any handgun or had any kind of weapon. And what Kelly says at this point is he says, if a guy's running and, and, and he turns, He's going to turn and he's going to point it at you just in a just in a mode of turning. He's going to point it at you. So yes, they turned the rifle and pointed it towards me. And again, that's with the knowledge that we already have that he already told Agent Morcell that they were too far away for him to tell if they had weapons. So what's important about this statement? that Kelly made to agent or to Detective Ainsa. He didn't admit he shot his AK-47 until 30 minutes into the, into the interview, and that's because he had something to hide. He knew he'd killed Gabriel. He didn't say anyone pointed a gun at him until Di Detective Ainsa asked him about it, and he didn't say he was in fear for his life until Detective Ainsa suggested it to him. Now, after this interview with George Kelly, late into the evening of January 30th of 2023 and early into the morning of January 31st of 2023, detectives Ainsa and other members of his team worked to serve a series of search warrants. They served some search warrants on the house. Um, they served some search warrants on the vehicles and the surrounding outbuildings. And you'll hear that during that series of search warrants, um, they recovered the AK-47 that we showed you in the picture that was used in this incident. They asked for assistance from, we're a small department, so we asked for assistance not just from the Department of Public Safety, but also for, from ATF. They have a, a dog that can sniff for explosives and can find uh, spent casings. And so we utilized their canine uh, to look for the spent casings. And in this case, we're talking a very high-powered rifle that um, went through, through and through the body and into the desert. That projectile could be up to a mile away. That projectile was not covered, recovered by the ATF canine, and it was not recovered even based on detectives' efforts with a metal detector. The officers did recover nine fresh AK-47 casings near the back patio of George Kelly's residence. And the first one was actually discovered by the canine. Um, and I'll show you that photograph in a minute. The other eight casings were discovered by uh, Detective Joe Bunting, who's now Sergeant Joe Bunting. He found those um, looking during the daylight um, the following morning, and with his, he also had a metal detector, I believe. But again, because of the terrain and the type of weapon used, the projectile was not recovered in this case. So we talked a little bit about the weapon earlier, the AK-47, and we talked about the bullets or the rounds, but I've been using a phrase that I didn't explain to you, and that is a spent casing. So the bullet or the, or the um, round has several parts to it. It has the projectile, that's the piece of metal that's on the top that you can see that's shiny um, on, the, on the 
full lit that's in this picture. And then on the bottom is the dark, darker part. And that part's called the casing. And inside the casing are the explosives that cause the projectile to um, spew out at the top of the, of the round. And so what's left over and what ejects from the weapon is called a spent casing. That's just that metal piece that's left over. Ma'am, we're in Arizona. Everybody knows what a gun is. That the explosives are now out of and the projectile is now out of. So nine casings were recovered um, around the area of George Kelly's back patio. And on the right in these pictures, is that your right? Yes, is the spent casing. On the left, you can see the see the rounds or the or the bullets. Now, during that search warrant, I indicated that um, detectives found the semi-automatic assault rifle, the AK-47. It was in George Kelly's bedroom, and it was behind the door, and it had a sweater over it. Um, George Kelly told the detectives that he always keeps that weapon by his back patio door. It was not there that day when detectives came. And in fact, what you'll hear is that um, it was really late when detectives were there. They took that photograph on the left the first time they were there, and they left the AK-47 behind. They had to cut during their second search warrant, they came back and recovered the AK-47. Um, but that is the AK-47. It was in the same spot when they came back and they did recover it during the second search warrant. This is the ATF canine that found the first um, casing in this case. And you can see the, the tent, the evidence tent is where that first casing was located. The next day, um, you can see detectives have located the other eight casings in this case. And just to give you an idea where those casings are located, this is just a still shot of that aerial drone footage we looked at. And you can see the yellow circle is where the eight casings were discovered by the detective. And the one in blue is the one casing that was dis discovered by the canine. All right, yeah. let's, uh, I'm sorry, it's um, almost noon. Let's break for the lunch hour. I don't have any additional information about the water situation. I saw my court administrator coming in here, but uh, I doubt it's fixed yet. We're going to break for lunch, be back in the jury room at 1.30. We'll find out what the water situation is and decide to go from there. But if, said if, if they haven't fixed it and are not able to fix it shortly after there, we'll probably just recess for the day. But Let's uh, be optimistic about that, and I'll see you back in the jury. We'll see you back in court. Please be in the jury room at 830. Please remember the admonition of the court. That applies to break at all times. Well, we did find out they did fix the water. So we got some kind of verdict already. Thank you so much for coming out. Now we made it through day one. Day one is officially done. Um, and I will get day two out next. I'm off to work and I will see you all later. Hope you guys have a great day. See ya.